enough for me, man. Wow. That's a pretty good song. I think, didn't, I thought maybe even Debbie and Gary sang that at Grace one time, no? They might have. My Uncle Tim and my dad, the, they uh, love that song, yeah, so man. his parents were close with them, so they're probably yeah. oh. I, I, I just remember, uh, you hear the, uh, the folks out, like the four grand pianos up there, and like yeah. 1,500 people singing, it just like crushes you. Yeah. It's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah, the value of one. Pretty cool, man. Mm -hmm. All right. Finish up old Hosea 7. Tonight, get it rolling. Star construction. Any update on Carissa? Have you heard from about Lucy Miller, her grandmother? Keep praying for her, but obviously, Carissa, as we know, is she's lost, as far as we know, correct? So, but let's keep praying for her, man. She's on, put her on the list back there. I, excuse me, I put her grandma on the list. I don't know if I put Carissa on. It's C A R I S S A. I'm giving a shot. Do you even know? C H. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't come back. You messed up my spell, man. <laughs> she seemed to have a good time Wednesday, so we'll see. See how it comes comes back, but Brother Bert's got this coming Wednesday night, so <laughs> we, we might lose her, but that's okay. We might, we might lose her, man. You know, she's on, she's on the hook, and then she's, <laughs> she's off back in the water. Man. <laughs> Welcome back, Bert. Good to have you back, man. <clears throat> yeah. First number 11, Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. We looked at that a couple weeks ago, just a dove just flittering all around and just no direction, no anything. And it comes from no heart, no heart for God. And they go to Egypt and Assyria for their help when they're in trouble, when they should go to the God of glory. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them, bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Woe unto them, for they have fled from me. Destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. And they have not cried unto me with their heart. When they, are, uh, when they howled upon their beds, they assemble themselves for corn and wine, and they rebel against me. Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Thank you again, Father, for the night. Thank you for the opportunity to meet around the Word of God. Thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost of God. If we yield to Him how we can change our hearts and minds to be more in line with the book. Thank you for saving our souls from hell, Father, and providing the blood of your precious Son as the atonement, the redemption for all eternity. Thank you, Father, for valuing our soul that we would not perish and go to hell. Thank you for the plan you had for the Gentiles, and thank you, Father, for the foreknowledge you had in seeing Israel reject your Son. And It's just amazing to see all those verses fit into perfect place and yet not ruin anything in the future. For your soon coming, King. I thank you and praise you for how good you've been, and I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, spread my net, he says. It's a weird thing. Uh, you don't want God to hunt you down. A net is meant to snare things, to entrap things. It's meant to get things to become captive. Now, God had given that land, as you know, way back in Genesis. He gave that land to Abraham Isaac and Jacob. It's still true today. I, I don't really know much about what's going on in Israel and Hamas and all that crazy stuff. I'm not shocked by it. It's pretty wild to see some of the images now because everybody has a phone and I guess what they're doing to some of the kids and the babies and stuff is just absolutely vile. I'm not shocked. Ishmael hates Isaac. That is not going to change until Jesus Christ comes back to this earth. There's going to be wars and just things going on, but you're not in Matthew 24, you're not in Mark 13, you're not in Luke 17 or 19, you are not in the tribulation period, though you get to see some nice you know, hiccups and burps and things like that of what's going on in time. I do believe it's neck and down. I do believe the church age is 
uh, rapidly coming to a close, but I don't get all freaked out about it. Man, I'm not looking for the Antichrist or all this craziness with Netanyahu and all that. I'm looking for Jesus Christ to come. In the meantime, I have the gospel of the grace of God that's been committed to my trust, committed to your trust, the word of reconciliation. That's what I'm to be about, my Father's business, the reconciling of the lost to Christ and the edifying of the saved to be more like Jesus Christ. That will keep your mind on, on focus. But God is without a question... He, he uses the net in history with Nebuchadnezzar and uh, uh, um, Sennacherib and all that, but he's going to use the net in the future for the nation of Israel. And I'll say this, and I'm going to be done with this thing about what's going on in Israel. They may win, I think I said on Wednesday night, they may win this war because Israel can still fight, man. <laughs> they've, they're, they're, they're pretty good at fighting, man. But the reality is there's going to come a time when they can't fight anymore, the church will be gone and the body of Christ is out of here and Israel is not going to be able to fight and their rockets and their iron dome and all that craziness. It's not going to help them one bit. So what do I have to pray for right now? Uh, that folks will get saved before they get pink misted. There's people dying right now going to hell. There's people dying right now they're going to glory. I'm still to pray for the gospel to be propagated through that area. I'm not to, to pray for Israel to have superiority and all that stuff. I want to see the gospel still flow through even a horrible war-torn situation. Because who cares who wins the war if you die and go to hell? It's not going to matter, man. But there will come a time where Israel just cannot win anymore, and their redemption is going to come from Jesus Christ on a white horse. And that's going to be, going to be a great day. But we see right here this has got some historical and obviously the doctrine of the future with Israel and what's going to happen to him. Go to, uh, about the net, go to Ezekiel 12. Go to Ezekiel 12. I get all wigged out with these guys in the pulpit teaching, you know, in the last times. You've been in the last days since Jesus Christ walked the earth. Does anybody know that from reading their Bible? Hath in these last days done what? Spoken to us by his son. <laughs> That, when Jesus Christ walked the earth, those three and a half years, guess what? That started the clock ticking. That's why when he sits back down in Acts 7, that's when the stopwatch goes click again and stops. Now you're in the times of the Gentiles. How long those go? Until you hear come up hither. And they're still going to walk through that temple even the tribulation period for 40 and two months. It's a wild, it's a wild book, man. But to say you're, you're, I mean, you've been in the last days for a long time, man. A really long time. So don't, don't get freaked out about it. Go hand out a gospel track. Have a good time witnessing about your Savior. All right, let's do this. Ezekiel chapter number 12. Look at the net for a minute. Uh, 8 through 16. Let's go. Well, this is freaky. You guys are usually staggered, but now we got the whole crazy family together, man. So <laughs> let's do Jonathan 8 through 16. You're usually staggering, you know. That's messing me up, man, bad. 8 through 16, please. Not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? Say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, This burden concerns the prince of Jerusalem, and all the house of Israel are among them. Say, I am your sign, like as I have done, so shall it be un unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. Mm -hmm. And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight, and shall go forth. They shall dig through the wall to carry out their life. He shall cover his face, that he see not the ground with his eyes. My net also will I spread upon him. There you go. And he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he shall die there. And I will scatter toward every wind all that are about him, to help him, and all his bands, and I will draw out the sword after them. And they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall scatter them among the nations, and disperse them in the countries. But I will leave a few men of them from the sword, from the famine, and from the pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the heathen, whither they come, and they shall know that I am the Lord. That net is going to be used, particularly coming in the future with the nation of Israel. He's going to snag them and take them away into captivity. But you know what's really cool about that? He says, I'm going to leave a few back. How many did he leave back in the Book of Romans chapter 11, when Elijah's mully grubbing with all the grubs and the mullies at the, down at the, the brook Kidron, how many did not bow the knee? So there's always going to be a remnant that God 
rescues out of Israel. There's always going to be a remnant. And as he said, though they be as the sand of the sea, they're, are they going to get down to, to 7,000 in Israel? I wouldn't be shocked. I don't know what the, uh, the population of, is of Israel right now, currently. How many million it is, I don't know. But it, would it shock me when you see a third here and a third here and a quarter here and the world getting decimated in the tribulation period and Israel just being hounded that they get down to 7,000? I wouldn't be shocked. It wouldn't shock me at all that that's the number. I, I don't know if that's the case or not, but interesting to think about. But God will use a net to snare his people. Why is he using a net to snare them? Because they have rejected the God of glory, their king, and everything he had done for them. Paul and I were talking on the street yesterday, and uh, I don't know if... It's kind of weird. You, like, preach some things, and it kind of hits him, like, a year later, <laughs> which is okay. But he's like, you ever notice how we have a tendency to chase idols, too, like Israel did? <laughs> I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> and then I have to walk over here to get separation, biblical separation <laughs> from him. And I'm like, Father, please, get full oxygen going to his brain again. <laughs> please, I'm begging you. And I'm like, <laughs> but I'm like, it, it is true when you go, what happens to you and I when we go a whoring from our God? Don't you get into a net of trouble? that most of the time you stitched for yourself, and God says, well, have fun on that net. You know when you see an animal get in one of those nice nets? The more they struggle, what happens to them? The deeper they get into that net. If that's not an object lesson for you and I as New Testament Christians, and it should have been for Israel, I don't know what is. The more you struggle with that net, the more you get entangled in that net. And the more it chokes you off, and the, the, the less hope you see. Instead of just saying, Lord, i got to stop struggling and let you get me out of this net because there's no way, for me, no way for me to pull myself out of it. What's the easiest way to get out of the ditch you digged? You dug for yourself, excuse me. What's the easiest way to get out of that ditch? The first thing you got to do when you're in the ditch is stop digging. What do we typically do? Get in the ditch. Go whoring from our God, that's the, then they went there, and what do we do? We just go a little further down the road and keep on digging, and then before, oh Lord, and you get so deep, you, the only place you can look is up. Well, if you'd stopped right at the beginning and not done the whore, you wouldn't have gotten to the ditch. Israel could have done the same thing and rescued themselves from it, but now he says, you know what? Now, now, now I'm going to throw the net, and I'm a master catcher of fowl. I can catch anything, man. And I'm going to net you up, and the more you fight against me, the worse it's going to be, and I'm going to throw you into Babylon. It's a horrible, horrible thing, man. Jeremiah chapter 16, please. Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah 16. All this Old Testament stuff, man. <laughs> if you don't get anything out of this, man, thank God you're a New Testament Christian. <laughs> thank God you are a child of God forever, man, through the faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Because, boy... You want to be an Old Testament Jew or, oh man, I'd like to see that stuff up on that mountain. Wouldn't that be awesome? No, nope. because you know where I'd be? I'd be by the golden calf. Oh, oh, wouldn't that be cool to see the earth open up and swallow up Dathan and Byron Court? No, I'd probably be in the insurrection with them and get swallowed up and go to hell forever. I'm happy right where I'm at, New Testament, child of God, sealed, signed, and delivered through Jesus Christ. But going through the Old Testament, man, it should make you appreciate just how good we have it through the Savior, man. Jeremiah 16. Uh, Jennifer, if you could. Hmm. 14 through 21. Okay, we've, you can take it. Yeah. And I, I know you're like. <laughs> well, now, what did they say? What did they say in verse 14? What was their contention? What are they saying? They're, there's going to come a time when they say what? They don't say that the Lord lives. Where's the Lord? He's not even alive. What? It, where is he? Isn't that what we read in Hosea? The redeemed speak lies about me. Oh, there is no God. 
If there was a God, he'd care for me. If there was a God, he'd, he'd actually show up and, and defend me. If there was a God, he would actually, he'd actually give me victory over everything in my life that I want victory on. And you start speaking lies, even as a redeemed person, about your God. That's a pretty big lie. Well, God's, God's not alive anymore. And then what's the next verse say? Oh, no, he is alive. I just want to tell you, he is alive, and he will keep his promise. But when you're in despair and hurting and you're on your bed and you're sick, you don't think God even cares about you. Uh, who likes to pray when they're sick? <laughs> who likes to read their Bible when they're sick, man? I'll, I'm not being smart with you, man. It's easier just to flick the TV on. I'm not coming down to anybody for that or for flick your phone on or whatever you, or whatever it is you, you flick. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Kenny flicks his chainsaw. I don't know what he does when he's, when he's sick. He's in his bed. And he's trying to catch some sleep. But honestly, you don't feel like doing anything spiritual when you're sick. You barely feel like do, doing it when you're, when you're feeling healthy. But when you're sick, man, you don't think God cares for you. You don't think anything. Uh, oh, man, he doesn't even care for me. He doesn't hear him. Look, I'm sick sitting here in bed, and I got COVID for the 19th time, and I'm not doing good. And, uh, and you're, you know what you're saying? You're saying a lie. And basically, you're saying God's not alive. God, God's not really living. Because obviously he can't be living or else he'd give some more care to me. You see, see, that's how real this becomes now. When you read that verse, you're like, oh, that's Israel. Pfft, I'm not like that. Sure you are. When you don't get what you want, when you ask the Lord for it over and over again, and he's actually protecting you from giving it to you, and you say, well, pfft, he must not really care about me. And in effect, you're saying, well, God's not really up there listening to me. How many times have you prayed the same prayer, but you wouldn't admit it, it's really vain repetition, but it is vain repetition? Because you didn't think he heard you the first time you said it. Oh, come on, man. Well, at least that's the honest honest tonight, man. It's in, and I'm, I'm having a heart attack right now, but that's okay. <laughs> but, I mean, think about it for a minute. You pray and you're like, did he really hear that? Let me, you know what, let me pray that again with a little more emphasis. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you got to, no, you got to, ah, you to, oh, Dios, I'm going to see us alone, And you're going, yeah, man. Because he hears, <laughs> no, oh yeah, you got it, then you got to. Yeah, that's real spiritual, when you start getting all smashed, you get all smashed on the Lord, that, that's real spiritual, man, man, but what happens is, we, we treat the Lord just like Israel, like, oh, he's not, he's not alive, oh no, no, let me remind you, he is alive, but just because you're in the net and in captivity doesn't mean he doesn't care for you. And that's what the conversation starts out. But look, look at how the net progresses here. Go ahead, Jennifer, another breath. You're good to go. Look, but look, 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 look what he actually uses in verse 16. What, this is a great verse, man. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the hold of the rocks. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from my eyes. First, I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double, because they have defiled my land. They have filled mine inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth mm -hmm. and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies oh. and envy and things therein there is no profit. Shall a man make gods unto himself and they are no gods? <laughs> Oh, I'm not alive? You don't believe I'm really living? I'll, I'll show you how alive I am. I'm going to send people to hunt you down in every nook, every cranny, every mountain, every hole you can hide in. I think there was somebody like that. His name was Hitler. His blood be on us and on our children. Hold that thought for 1,900 years. Stalin, not just Germany. You need to read about the Jews' persecution down. And you know what? This is not me being crass at, at all. They invited that on themselves. Can they still be saved? Of course they can still be saved. If they take the grace of God and apply the blood of atonement of Jesus Christ, sure they can be saved. But there's something about them even now, that temporary blindness and all those things from uh, Romans 11 and all that. And I understand that where this is historically in the future and all that, but you see some of that through history with the hunters and fishers how God uses those two occupations to go get his people, like that net he used in the previous passage. So it's a serious deal to turn against God, man, if you're Israel. It's a real serious deal. You know, what's, to me, what's cool about that? What's the occupation of the men he first picked to be disciples? 
So I sent fishers to go snatch you out of the water you were living in and pull you out into captivity, but oh, I'm, I'm going to send you some fishers that actually are going to come after your soul. It's a wild thing, man, how God works that, but he's, he's nobody to play with regarding you setting up gods that are no gods and all that against him. Go to 18, Jeremiah 18. Actually, you know what? Go to Joshua. No, we're going to skip that. Go to Joshua. Go to Joshua 23. Go to Joshua 23. I got to put it in overdrive like Jennifer's reading. I got to put in the kick that <laughs> kick kick the nitrous in, man. Here we go. Joshua 23. Deb, can you get six through sixteen? I know it's a lot of reading, but it's, it's good. It builds character, man. <laughs> Look at this. Yeah. take you up in a net, I'm going to take you up, in, and I'm going to pull you, and, and, and the people, the people I beat and defeated on your behalf, guess what? Now they're going to be snares to you and traps to you. The ones that I had beaten down in front of you, you turn from me? Okay. Now they're going to rule over you. Let's get to the cure. Go to Psalm 124, please in the future, and I'll take it out doctrinally, through the tribulation period till the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Psalm 124, Brother Bert. Read, uh, if you could, can you read the whole thing, please? A Psalm of the Greeks of David. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been, on the, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick, hmm. and their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey for their teeth. Our souls escaped as a bird out of the snare. Look of the at that. The snare is broken, and the water <laughs> Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's the, that's the escape. But prophetically, this doesn't come until Jesus Christ comes down through the clouds. So you've got the historical aspect, which is important. You've got the practical to the child of God who gets themselves locked up in their own snare and their own net, and God lets that snare and that net take them because you reap what you sow. But doctrinally, which is the most important part of the Word of God, is this thing takes you 
through the tribulation period out to the millennial kingdom when Christ comes and says, you know what, all those snares and all those traps and all those gins and all those things that were set for you, I'm breaking them off you and now you're free and the land really is yours with the rightful king on the throne. You say, what's the big deal about that in Hosea? There's a part in chapter 8, which we'll get to next Sunday, where he says, you guys set up kings I didn't pick. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. God has his king in mind. And you went and picked your own, so go, go reap the benefits of it. See, how, see where that gets you. You'll just have nothing but snares and traps and nets. It's horrible, man. But thank God the king will come back one day and set that all correctly. All right, Romans chapter 3. He says in verse 13 of Hosea chapter 7, Destruction unto them spoken lies against me. <laughs> yeah, man. It's hard to think that you would speak lies against God, but man, you just think of all the times you've misrepresented to people, either through word or testimony or attitude or action. You've actually, yeah, you've lied against them, and you're like, wow, what are you doing, man? Against someone who cannot lie, it's impossible for him to lie, and he's a, not a man that he should lie. But I form lies against him when I won't tell people the truth. That's why preaching that we have here from all the guys, and hopefully from myself, and preachers we like to hang around, they will tell you the truth of the Word of God. It's not meant to be hurtful. It's not meant to be just, just always in your face and confrontational and just shred you down. That's not the purpose of it. But you can't go through this book and not take an honest look at yourself the way God sees you and then lie about it. You know, uh, I, yeah, I, I know Joel Osteen's not probably the worst one, but he's up there. Enjoy your best life today. I mean, that's like his mantra. You know, your best life today. <laughs> Is that the way God sees it there, Joel? But you know what? If you preach the Word of God, you're not going to have, unless you just hit the gold mine of psychotic people, you're never going to have a church. He's running 40-something thousand. And a Sunday, he meets in, I think, uh, I don't know if it's this old San Antonio, the, the Hemisphere Arena, and that thing is just mobbed. It's mobbed with people. And he's on his big, you know, the dais, the pulpit area. And, and, and there's literally, uh, there's thousands of people. And they're all just all sitting there. You know, like those little, what was the little yellow things in Toy Story? The, the claw. Yeah. The, the, the claw. <laughs> Oh, 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 and they, Kenny, don't pick that picture and put it on the internet, man. <laughs> and you start editing my photo, editing my photos, catch the least worst side I have. Man, so I just put me up there. It's hurtful, man. It's hurtful. But your time's coming Wednesday. Don't worry, buddy. Yeah. Anyway, no, I mean, but they, they're all sitting there entranced by him, and I'm like, this guy hasn't said anything that makes any biblical sense. And he's going on for 34, and they're all like, <laughs> they're like retarded seals. It is. It, you know what? You know, you have a way of bringing back evil on me. Thank you for that. But no worry, we'll tell that story later, man. But I'm just sitting there, and these people are, no Bible, no Bible. They're just sitting there. And if there is a Bible, the woman has it. I watch this stuff just for entertainment, just to see how far, progressively far down the road we've really come as a Christian nation. It's just disgusting, man. And a preacher gets up and preaches his guts out, who cares for his people and actually says the truth and doesn't lie about God, doesn't make him out to be Santa Claus or some stinking weird Candyland figure, actually preaches the God of the Bible, five people, seven people. 15 people. I'm, I'm not complaining at all. I'm just saying that's the way it rolls, man. And that's okay. Because you don't, you don't want to make lies about God, man. Because there's going to be coming a day when he gets a chance to ask you what you really thought about all this. It's called the judgment seat of Christ if you're saved. Uh, Romans chapter number three. Who's up, Taylor? Yes. One through four, please.
For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, and but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. What a great verse. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. He's the only true one you're ever going to run into that is never going to tell a white lie, a fib, a half-truth. He's going to tell it to you the way it really is. And yet these people are at the point of their lives, Israelites, they're saying, yeah, I'm, we're just going to lie about God. He doesn't take care of us. He's not alive. and pfft, He's never done anything for us. Oh, Egypt, would you help us? Uh, Assyria, would you come and take care of our battles for us? Because this God, I mean... He's nowhere to be found. And they lie about him in front of Gentile heathen nations. Isn't one of the things that Shennacherib said way back in Kings? He goes, this God. Well, let me tell you, is he the God of the valleys too? Remember that question comes up? Uh, it seems like he's only a God when things are going good. Well, let's, is he going to be the God of the valley? Look at what great Shennacherib's done for you. I've done everything. I've taken everybody out. And this God, we'll see, we'll see if he's the God of the valleys. And guess what? God did show up in the valley. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He's right there with you. He is the God of the valleys. He's the God of the mountains. He's the God of glory, man. Not to lie about him. There's nothing, I mean, what are you going to lie? He's the greatest God there ever was or ever will be, man. Go to Psalm 78. Let's see if I can cut this down a little bit. Psalm 78. Not because it's you, buddy, but it's just... Uh... Do you have it to Jen? She'll do it in the camera. <laughs> no. <laughs> Jen's going to need some oxygen after this, yeah. man. I want, I want to pick... Uh... Haley, go 33. Uh... Go... Go... Th Seven, Psalm 78, 33 to 39. Actually, 40 would be good. Please. Therefore their days they be consumed in vanity, and their years in trouble. When he slew them, then they slew them, <laughs> and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their redeemer. Okay, now picture this for a minute. They, they forget him. All these things happen to him, and then they go, Wow, I could have had a V8. Let me turn back to, you know what, let's go, you know what, let's, in, let's inquire of God. Who, wow, who came up with that brainstorm? That's a phenomenal, that's a genius move, if you know what I mean. That's a genius move. You know, there's all this stuff that's happened to us, and why don't, you know, why don't we go talk to God about it? Great idea, whoever had that idea, give him a gold star. And then they go to him, and he's entreated of them, but look what happens after that. They remember him. And turn to their rock. Look at verse 36. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their mouth. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness? First of all, great verse in verse 39 about no reincarnation. Yeah. That's a great verse. I know we like to use Hebrews 9.27, and as a point on the men wants to die, but after this, the judgment. But look at verse 39. He remembered there were a wind that passed away and was in what? Doesn't come back. No second chance. Anyway, I digress. As you go back to this and look at it, they're, they're speaking lies against him, against the God of glory. He has done nothing but been good to these people. So obviously the spiritual application would be, has he not been anything but good to you and I, man? And when you lie to him and about him, about your real condition, or you shade him when you talk to people, you don't have to be crass about hell, but you ought not to air condition it. Uh, if you're dealing with somebody that's saved and you're trying to feel it out a little bit and maybe they don't know what Bible version to use, yes, you have to use some discernment. I understand that. But you ought not to shade away from the fact that the King James Bible is the very word and words of Almighty God. And you ought not to have to sit there and shade it and say, you know what, well, you know, I know, that's, you know I'd rather, uh, yeah, I mean, 
and eh, maybe it is easier, but you know, I, I, like somebody said, I prefer the King James. I don't prefer it. It is the book. I don't prefer it. It's the word and words of Almighty God, whether I like it or not. My preference doesn't come into it. But when you talk to people, don't, you say, what's the deal about a lie? A lie is not, it's just massive falsehood. It could just be, you shade it for your advantage, for your reputation to be preserved. And you drag God into that foolishness. Oh, what do you, what do you think, preacher? Is there only one, I mean, really, is there only one way to heaven? I've got a grandma that's been really faithful to the Catholic Church for 35, 40 years, and she does I, there's, there's one way to heaven, man. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't you think that's it? It's one way to heaven. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, but don't you think that's a little narrow? It is narrow. But it's open unto whosoever will. And you don't have to kind of change it or fluff it up. You just say the truth. And you can say it in love, man. But I would not want to be caught lying against God. Or lying to God. When he obviously knows what the truth is. <laughs> He's like the greatest, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the, the, uh, the light? He's the greatest lie detector in the world, man. He is instant sodium pentothal. You say something to him, he's like, nah, that, I know what the truth is. Why don't you just tell me the truth? That's why good Bible preaching hits you right in the heart, man. It just reveals you for what's going on. Ezekiel 33, please. Ezekiel 33. Karen, Ezekiel 33, verses 30 to 33. We called him Zeke when we were growing up. Ezekiel 33, 30 to 33. That is a great verse. For with the mouth they show me much love, but their heart is not anywhere near doing what I told them to do. Love you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. I'm not doing that. Lord, oh, you're the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Lord, thank you for saving me from hell, but not today. See, it becomes a little more real when you get practical with it and you understand that I'm really not that obedient of a son to him that I should be. And all oh, those mean old Israelites, stupid Israelites, no wonder they went to captivity. I'm glad Nebuchadnezzar got them, blah, 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 blah. Well, guess what? You do the same thing every day when he tells you to do something you don't do it. But you show him with your mouth that, oh, I love you, God. Oh, I'm, Jesus. I'm all about Jesus, man. Look at me. I've got my Jesus t-shirt. i got my Jesus everything. And then when it comes down to brass tacks, I'm not going to do what he says, man. Okay, you showed me much love with your mouth, but your heart's so far from me. What's, what's really going on there, man? That's why God's after the heart, man. He's after, if he gets the heart, he'll have everything else. Giving doesn't become an option uh, for you. You'll give the right way with a willing mind and a willing heart. Opening your mouth for Christ won't be a problem. Reading your Bible won't be a problem. Praying won't be a problem. If he has your heart, none of the things that he asks you to do will become a burden. It's just he doesn't have our heart. If he has part of your heart, then you're half-hearted, and that's like being double-minded, man. It's a crazy thing. Go to Deuteronomy 32. Let's look at when they howled. <laughs> they howl on their beds. That's what the stupid corgis do at 6 in the morning. But Riley doesn't howl. She has a very sharp, piercing voice like her mom. And she's irritating. Just saying. I trained her. She's my dog. She's, right, she's my clone as a dog. And she's loud, boy. And she's like, rawr, rawr, and just loud and just pierces the whole house, man. And she's howling on the bed. I just think she's just howling on the bed, man. 
Well, what are they howling on their bed for? And you say that's a crazy thing when you think about it, isn't it? They're howling on their bed, but they're not howling for God. They're like howling out of pain and anguish and torture, and they won't turn back to God. It's a crazy picture when you think about it, just sitting there howling. What, what do people say when, they, uh, when there's a full moan out and people get crazy? What do they go out and do? Howl to moan. You're from Stafford. Don't be looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about, man. <laughs> yes, what's that? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, oh, woo, woo, and you're just out there freaking out, man. You know, Bark at the Moon, you know, your buddy Ozzy Osbourne making crazy albums, man. Bark at the Moon, all that crazy stuff, man. Well, they're howling, but it's, the howling is not towards God. It's, it, you say it's crazy. No, man, it's just your Bible, man. Every word of God's pure. I do believe that. And it's a, it's a great picture. Go to uh, Justin, get 32, 7 to 14. 32, 7 through 14, please. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste, hollow, and wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirring up her nest, fluttering fluttereth over her young, spreading abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead them, did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock, and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kin, and milk of sheep, with fat of lambs, and rams of the bread breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat and now did his drink of pure blood of the grape. Now you say why do we have to read all that? Where, where did it say he took them out of? A howling wilderness. Do you remember? Now you say that's stupid. No, that's what he rescued them out of. And now instead of remembering that and the deliverance that they, and the butter for the kind and the sheep and everything that God gave to them they're now in their beds howling and crying out and just languishing instead of going back to the God that actually delivered them from the first howling wilderness. You know when the wind is whipping around? It's just a howling wind. It makes those crazy sounds, man. The trees are moving. And the stupid leaves fall for the 15th time on my lawn after I just picked them up yesterday for three and a half hours. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about, Kenny? You know what I'm talking about, man. They were, that lawn, you could have, I was hitting golf balls. I was like, and then, <laughs> and I'm like, God, you don't love me. Leaves covered my yard. <laughs> I'm like, man, this thing is spotless. It's like the Masters. You can play golf off this thing, and then, <laughs> bang. And the big fat leaves, too. What's that? Just put the pride down. Oh, this is terrible, man. It's terrible. Shut up, Kenny. No, that's it. That's it, man. I did this for you. I'm going to Jubilee. Look what I do. For you. Look what I do for you before I leave. Leave. I'm looking at my latte. I'm like, it's like nothing got done. But it's that howling wind comes through. And so you see the picture now. They're sitting on their bed going, oh, and they should be calling out to God. But when you're howling out, you're just like, you're, you're in, they're in such idolatrous and horrible situations. They're actually back in the howling wilderness. And they're howling on their beds, just tossing and turning and to and fro. But they won't go to the God that delivered them from the howling wilderness. It's crazy, man. Why do we go, why do we go to everybody but our God for help? Why do we cry out and howl to everything except for God? I know there's a time for counsel. I understand that. There's a time for, for you to seek counsel from others. I understand that. But why not go to the wonderful counselor, the mighty God first, the one that delivered you from all that? But I it's just don't do it, man. All right, go over to, <laughs> uh, go to Zephaniah, Kenny Zephaniah. Yeah, I know, man. Zephaniah. 
see if I can cut this down a little bit for you here. Just a, just a couple verses on howl. It's, honestly, when you see howl in a King James Bible, it's usually a negative. It's a negative. It's not a positive. And it's definitely a negative in Hosea. So, Brother Kenny, to try and... Can you go 4 through 11, please? Which chapter? Chapter 1. I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of Chedabrims? Uh, Kem Kemarims. Do you, just a, just a quick English little lesson here, or the way you read in your Bible. If you see a CH in a King James Bible with a line under it, do you yours have a line in it? That's a K sound. You pick chemical of all the words you pick? <laughs> no, sorry. Man. If you see CH in a King James Bible, your pronunciation key in the beginning will help you. The CH with a line under it is a K sound. If it's not, then it'd be like cheese. Sitch instead of k with a K. So that's chem chemarim. Chem chemarims. The name of the chemarims with the priests. And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear by the Lord, and that swear by Mel Kim. There you go. You saw. You saw the line, didn't you, Kenny? Yep. Malcam. There you go. And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for him. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. <laughs> Second for, coming. Yep. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice, that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. That's interesting. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold, which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, mm -hmm. saith the Lord, that there shall be a noise of a cry from the fish gate, mm -hmm. and then howling from the second, and a great crashing from the hills. How ye inhabitants of Mactesh, for all the merchant people are cut down, all they that bear silver are cut off. Okay, they do the howling, they do it upon their bed. Go to Micah chapter 2 while you're right here. Estee on Micah 2, please. Micah 2. One through three, please. So they howl, and they're on their bed, and it's not a good position to be in because why are they howling? They've forgotten the God of glory. They can, they, they've built so many idols and trusted so many things that were not God that now they're in a place of just literally they're howling on their bed. It's an unbelievable, to me, it's an unbelievable page. Go, Micah 2, 1 through 3, please. What are, they, what are they doing on their bed? They work evil upon their beds. They devise iniquity. And then when, it, when the sun rises, let's go to town. Plot and scheme it all night what we can do to rob and pillage and shed innocent blood and go wild. And, and you, where do they do it? They're on their bed. And the whole picture of this on their bed and howling and just rejecting the God that, that rescued them out of Egypt and delivered them from all those 
those ites, the Hittites and the Perizzites, and, and they're sitting there. And on, why are you not think, thinking about God? Have you guys ever woken up in the middle of the night and just can't sleep and you start praying? Do you go through Bible verses at night maybe when you're having a tough time sleeping? I'm not saying this to convict you. I'm, I do that. I have to. Roll over, not sleeping, go through some Bible verses. Think about some people to pray for. Not out loud, because Karen's KO'd. I don't want to wake her up, man. But I mean, you can pray without moving your lips. You, you can pray between you and the Lord. You can go through some Bible verses from your heart, run through your heart and give you peace and all that stuff. Well, it would be better to do that on your bed instead of howling and not turning to God and devising evil and iniquity on your bed. I, I don't know about you. I don't like having sleepless nights, man. Yeah. Tossing and turning. And the bedroom needs to be like 56. Yes. And the wind blowing and howling. <laughs> so I can just be there and I'm just, ah, oh, it's awesome. Uh, yeah. No, Riley's in her snuggie. She's in her whoopee. <laughs> She's in her whoopee, man. Psalm 149. Psalm 140. She's in her whoopee, man. Psalm 149. So how should it be on your, on your bed? This is pretty cool. Pauly, Psalm 149, 5 through 9. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their bed. <laughs> Sion's going to go home. Shine, Jesus, shine. <laughs> Ken's going to be like, Whoa. Woman, I'm sleeping. <laughs> She's practicing the piano in bed, man. It's pretty, that's, a, that's, a, that's a keyboard, man. Got a blanket that's a keyboard, man. She's sitting there jamming. Go ahead. Let the, praise, or let the high praises of God be in their mouth. And the two-edged sword. In That'd be cool to go to bed with that, man. That's the modern-day vernacular of a shotgun. That's it. That's it. The NIV says shotgun right there, man. So go ahead. To execute upon the That'd be a good thing to do on your bed, man. Sing aloud upon your bed. High praise God be in your mouth and two edged sword in your hand. The word of God. Go to Psalm 41. Go to Psalm 41. I'm telling you, folks, hiding that Bible in your heart and your mind will help you. Yeah. It will. I don't say that. It's just not a competition class of who memorized the most verses and all that stuff. It will help you in your walk with Jesus Christ. It'll get you through trouble and anguish and pain, and it'll fight the imaginations every one of us has. We all have imaginations. We all have vain thoughts. And to have that towards the sword in your hand and the praises of God in your mouth, boy, it'll, when, it'll, it'll take a lot of sleepless nights away from you, man. Psalm 41. Uh, Mo, please. No, I'm just thinking right now. Uh, one, one through three. Look at this. <laughs> what you want God to make your bed for you? Get up and make your bed. Lord, could you handle this for me? And you know you could bounce a quarter off of that. You're in the military, bounce it up. You know, you know if the Lord makes your bed, it's the bed you want to lay in. No critters, no ghouly monsters hanging out, man. No devils, man, no lizards. No spiders. You know, you wake up and things crawl up your leg. You're like, <laughs> you're freaking out, man. You know what I'm talking about, man. Maybe you can keep you from getting those hamstring cramps that just cripple you out. You know, you grab it and you roll off the side of the bed. Karen's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I'm dying. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, man. You get that when you're like. <laughs> and you, it's horrible, man. You know? And you can't get downstairs because you're in such pain to eat a banana to get potassium to get rid of the cramps. And you're like, I see some potassium, man. <laughs> you're this cramp. Like, <laughs> and then you move too quick and the other one locks up and you're like, <laughs> it's, it's horrible, man. You know what I'm talking about. You get those cramps. You know, some people get calf cramps on it, but I, no, I give them in the hammy, man. You move too quick and you're like, 
<laughs> Have you ever gotten one in your big toe? Yeah, I did. And, that, and it, it just, it, 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 you, you're looking like a, you're looking like one of those crazy trolls. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and your toe curls under, you're like. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Lord, make my bed, would you? Just <laughs> take away this crap. Take away this crap. Man, I got one of my big toe, man, a few months. I, I was just, I couldn't, I was just, it was like, you know, you're in such pain, you don't have it, you can't, you have it, you have no words. You're screaming, but there's, and you can't get your toe to move. It's horrible, man. It's like somebody hit you with a curare dart in the Amazon, man. You're like, oh, man. Anyway, how did I get that out of the verse? I have no idea, man. <laughs> Good, the Lord will... Anyway, you want that? Bert's, Bert's done, man. But it is funny when you think about this, man, how wrecked we are, man. Okay, how do we get a spiritual lesson out of this? For the New, the New Testament church, man. Yeah. If you're cramping, you lack, if you're cramping, you lack water. See, I, we could turn this whole thing. And just have the Lord make... What's that? Oh, man. That's, that's, Oh, man. Anyway, the Lord will make your bed for you. That's all I need to say about them. That's it, man. Instead of having the, instead of, well, I was howling on my bed. But the invisible, you're in such pain. You know, like when you got whipped by your parents so hard, it was, the pain was like, and your, and your scream goes like, that's the cramp in the bed of languishing, man. I'm just telling you. All right, sorry about that, man. I'm, I'm mental. Matthew 27. <laughs> that's, that's funny to anybody with a pulse that's ever lived any life, man. That big toe one, man. I, oh, I thought that was the death of me, man. I'd rather have a grizzly bear rip my pancreas out than go, than go through that again, man. <laughs> I mean, and you know, can't, I mean, you couldn't straighten that thing out with channel locks. <laughs> you know, it's just so stuck there. You know, nothing's moving it. It's just so it's horrible, man. Matthew twenty-seven. All right, just give me, give me, uh, give me two more verses. We're done, man. <laughs> Deb, I hope you don't have a patient tonight that takes you through that. <laughs> just have some potassium ready. <laughs> Matthew twenty-seven. Mackenzie, get Matthew 27, 1 through 5, please. Just to close out the chapter, it says the last thing they say in verse 16 of Hosea 7 is, they return, but not to the Most High. What did Judas do? He turned to himself. I'm trying to, not to get ahead of myself because 2 Corinthians will deal with that pretty heavily next week in chapter 7, but um, you got you to gotta be careful because you can trick yourself into false repentance. And your heart is still deceitful. I understand you're saved. You're by his temple. I, I understand that. But you can, you can fool yourself into thinking that I've turned back to the Most High. And you really haven't. Last one, deceitful bow. I'm just going to make a comment, and then we're going to pray, and we are out. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. <laughs> you get anatomy class here. You get English. You get, com you get the comedy story. You get everything, man. <laughs> he, says, he says about Israel, they're a deceitful bow. I like playing with a bow when I was a kid, not a compound one. We had recurves. We'd shoot with the old recurves, you know, the old fiberglass recurves and pull them back. Have a good time with the compound. Compounds are good too, man. Good time to shoot them. But he says you're a deceitful bow. What did he call them earlier? A silly dove. No direction. Well, what's a deceitful bow? It's off. 
doesn't shoot straight, doesn't shoot well, doesn't shoot consistently, you might pull it back, the string break. In other words, it's an untru it looks like a bow, it looks like it's going to perform like a bow, but Israel's in such a place that they, are, they have false repentance, or oh, it looks like they're turning back to me, but they're not turning back to me, they're turning back to themselves and to Egypt and to Assyria and everybody else, and they're a deceitful bow. They look like they shoot straight, they look like they're going to perform right, they look like they're going to be good in battle, but they're an absolute deceitful bow. That describes modern-day Christianity to a T. Look and smell like one, but when the heat's on and the battle comes, you're, you're actually a treacherous deceiver and a traitor. Psalm 75, I'll read this one. I, I'm sorry, 78, that's my fault. 78. Verse 56 says, Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not His testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow can't trust them. Look like, look like the right weapon. Look like they'll actually help you out in battle. Look like they'll be faithful and you can count on them. No real heart there, man, to do what's really right. Father, thank you again for the night. Pray your blessing as we go. Thank you for how good you've been to us. Thank you for Brother Burke getting an opportunity to preach down in Ledyard. That is a blessing, Father. Thank you for how good you've been to us to allow us to even open your book up in the pulpit anywhere or to speak on your behalf anywhere out in the street or to a neighbor or to a co-worker. It's, it's a blessing to represent you, but Father, it's also something you committed to us. Help us to be faithful in doing that through the power of the Spirit of God. Uh, Father, please keep the folks as we're away Wednesday night. Uh, please fill the singing and uh, the preaching with the Spirit of God and, and Brother Burton and the rest of the folks that will attend that you might get the honor and glory and praise. And Father, uh, please keep our journey safe down to Jubilee and the rest of the folks traveling, literally hundreds of people coming, Father, from all over the world. Help this to be a good time to honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and, and to see one another, encourage one another in the battle. We thank you and praise you for how good you've been in Christ's name. Amen. See you Sunday, Lord willing, the creek don't rise.